CRC family, what a moment this is to share with you as God is expanding the vision of CRC. The church in the Val Triangle has officially broken ground on our own land for the first 1,000-seater facility. And soon, this will be developed into a 3,000-seater state-of-the-art facility. This is all for the glory and for the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are yet to expand God's kingdom. I said we are yet to expand God's kingdom. Our purpose is to expand God's kingdom. So we are not settlers, we are not campers, we are movers and we are shakers. We are yet not to roll over, we are yet to take over. Come on, CRC. That's who we are. That's our DNA. We'll move and we'll get things moving wherever God has placed us. Absolutely, Ange. On that note, we're going to stand up and praise the Lord. Let's go. Good evening, CRC. Are you ready to praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Go on. Let's go. How could I praise the one who's 
saved my life When there are no words To express what you deserve Hey, come on! You deserve the greatest Be lifting up the highest Worthy of my everything This is why I praise You're worthy of all my praise In everything I do all that I go through, I give you all my praise. I got praise. I got praise. I got praise. I got praise. I lift my voice to you. I make a joyful noise. Oh, you've been so good I'd give you the whole world if I could You deserve the greatest You deserve the greatest Lift it up the highest Worthy of my everything This is why oh, This is why I praise you
presence on you tonight as we call on your name and we lift up your name, Lord. There is no one higher than you. And we look to you tonight and we worship you in this place. Come on, lift your hands together. He's here tonight. Just pour your heart on, heart on him tonight.
CRC Church, come on, just lift your hands and let His presence just begin to rain upon your homes, rain upon every church, rain upon your families. Yeah, just pray this prayer with me tonight. Before you pray, just listen. Moses said, how shall we be different from the people on this earth? Is it not your presence upon us? Our greatest hunger should be for His divine presence upon our lives. So I want you to say this simple prayer tonight as we begin. And just say this, more of you, Lord Jesus, and less of me. More of your presence. Let it be your presence that fills me and guides me and sets me apart from all the people of this earth. May your presence protect me, preserve me, and be my shield every day of my life. Thank you for your presence and for your love in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Come on. Come on, give him a praise for his presence, for his teenwoordigheid. Want hij is niet een historische God, niet. He's not some historical God. He's alive tonight. Welcome to Faith TV, Praise TV, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, CRC Online, radio stations, people across the nations of the earth, millions joining us for this service. May God touch you tonight and may your life never be the same again. For the many, many thousands there in Blivenite, we welcome you. Johannesburg, we welcome you. All the CRC churches from Cape Town to Gaborone, to Bintu, Ongedeva, wherever you are tonight, we are glad to have you with us in Jesus' name. And don't forget, Wednesday night, we are dedicating the house that the church in Kimberley has built. And we are going to celebrate. Come on, we are going to celebrate a habitation, a place where the presence of God will dwell. So we want to congratulate uh, Pastor uh, Brian and Sundry 
and then also your predecessor, Pastor Henny, who is the one who purchased that land and uh, put up that steel structure and uh, was the um, person who established that work. We are going to honor Pastor Henny and his son as well. And then Pastor Brian and Sonry that has taken that work to a whole nother level. We salute you and we thank God that we are co-workers in the body of Christ, laborers together to plunder hell and to populate heaven in Jesus' name. Come on, give somebody a high five and tell that person, God only has good things in mind for you. Good to see you all here tonight. Amen. Everybody under the age of 80. All the young people here tonight. Amen. This year I am celebrating 30 times two. As yeah, I told my children, you're not gonna uh, uh, write the other numbers. I I I I, I bind them. Amen. It's like I, I don't even understand what it is. But that's how quickly life happens. You're 30 today and tomorrow you're 30 for the second time. So uh, we celebrate 30 years in ministry, actually for CRC, but then personally for 38 years for myself. And the, yeah, you can give the Lord a, a praise. Amen. And then also um, celebrating 30 times two. You say, what's that? I don't, I don't say it. I, I don't want to hear it. Um, I want to talk about maybe one of the most important subjects we can talk about for our young people especially and for everybody one of the first things I learned after I got saved that is pursuing God and how to pursue God thank God we don't have some religion and we don't have some formula but we have access to God to Jehovah as a father and maybe the most important thing you can do after you are saved is to establish a deep personal relationship with God. Let me say this to you tonight. What you pursue will determine everything about you. And what you pursue or who you pursue says everything about you. It says who you truly are. It says everything about your character, your values, your treasure, your purpose in life and your destiny. So let's talk about pursuit of God. There was this great movie, I think Will Smith played in it, In Pursuit of Happiness. Actually a very good story. A man that had many setbacks in life and then he had this little boy and he was in pursuit of happiness and he bounced back and uh, got back on his feet and uh, everything that he lost was taken back to him. But um, I don't want to take away from that movie. I want to ask in the end of it all, what is happiness to you? And how, we def how do we define it? If I say happiness, what is the picture? What is the picture of your pursuit? What is it that you think will make you truly happy? What is it that will fill the void in your heart? I mean, Solomon, I encourage business people all the time to read the book of Proverbs, Wisdom, right? And Ecclesiastes, which addresses purpose. You never lose your purpose in the pursuit of the promises of God. So Solomon was the wealthiest man that ever lived this earth. Fact. Wealthier than the Rockefellers. Wealthier than Black Rock. Wealthier than all these people that people celebrate today. And you know, the Bible says people came from all over the world to see what he built. And they were impressed. The Queen of Sheba came and she said, you've done even more than I heard about. So everything he did... And, and, and the book of Ecclesiastes is a very, very interesting book because he has a man that is at the top of success. He says, whatever I desired, I, I, I took. Whatever I wanted to build, I built. He said, I had the best vineyards. I had the best horses. I had the best this, the best that. And uh, he says, it's all vanity. Then he writes at the end, vanity of vanities. Now, I can not think of that's not the Afrikaans word for vanity. Um, the Afrikaans here, the German honors, he said, it's a gejaag na vint. In other words, what you think is going to make you happy, when you get there, it's going to leave you empty. It's like looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. There is no pot of gold. So more money in your bank may pay the bills, but it's not going to fulfill what you are looking for. Another relationship, more prominence, more success. So what is it that we should pursue? What? 
should be our highest goal in life. And yes, we talk about winning the lost at any cost. But I'll tell you, my dear friend, you're not going to be a soul winner if you're not somebody that pursues God. Isaiah, when he pursued God and he was in the presence of God, he heard the heart of God and that moved Isaiah to say, here I am, Lord, use me. So we don't pursue a purpose. We don't pursue anything other than the living God. So let's talk about that tonight and start a new journey in the evening services. James chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What is he saying? He's talking to the church. I, I want somebody quickly to um, help me. Um, come here. So uh, he's going to be God tonight, okay? Stand there. So um, this is God. I mean, God's almighty, and, and, and God is, right? God doesn't change. God doesn't turn His back. Turn your back on me. God doesn't do that. Walk away from me. Catch him. God doesn't walk away from you. God, hello, don't walk away far, God. See, what are you doing now? You need to play God. Come stand here. There. Right. And God doesn't stand like that. He stands with his arms open wide, by the way. So, um, <laughs> you're going to give me a hug. We're going to put you in the acting team for the Easter play next year. In any case, so, so God says, draw near to me. Think about that for a moment. God's waiting for you and me to draw closer to Him. To have a more intimate relationship with us. So if we want to know God more intimately, we are the ones that have to draw closer to God. We need to make our way to Him because He's already given us access. And I understand when somebody is backslidden or somebody is a prodigal and they come back to God, then you don't have, God's not going to meet you halfway. It's like you don't have to take one step, God takes one step. Remember that prodigal son's father, the prodigal son's father, he was sitting on his stoop every day looking for his son to come back. Not with binoculars, but he had good eyesight, right? And when he saw his son a great way off, remember the son had backslidden. The son had spent all his livelihood living in sin, wasted his life, and then he realized, I'll be better as a slave in my father's house. So the son makes a comeback, and I want to say that a comeback is never easy, but a comeback is always possible. No matter what you face in life, a comeback is always possible. But you have to move in the right direction. I said you have, oh come on man, you can give the Lord a better hand clap than that. You have to move in the right direction. You have to turn into the right direction. And that means you have to turn to God. So um, when the prodigal son came and the father saw him, what did the father do? The father ran to him, right? I said the father ran to him. The father ran to him. What do you mean, Omar? And what did the father do? What did the father do? What did the father do? What's fault with you? It's like a Christian hug, this. It's like a. I'm trying to get you to illustrate a point here, so just be real for a moment. Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. No, that's not what the father did. I'll illustrate the father, okay? The father ran to him and the father embra embraced him and the father kissed him. Father kissed him. Listen, the stench and the stain of sin did not deter the father from his lost son. So when we talk about the backslider and the prodigal, you don't have to draw closer to God. You just have to take one step in the right direction then your father is going to come running and your father is going to embrace you and your father is going to kiss you, kiss you, kiss, kiss my cheek, man. And the, and the, and the, uh, yeah, you see, and the, uh, you just got girls, that's your problem. And the father uh, 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 kissed him 
and they put a robe upon him and put sandals on his feet and the father brought him back into the house and there was a great celebration. That's the God that you serve. You don't have a God that sits in the heaven with a knop kere, a God that sits ready to judge you and damn you and knock you over the head. You have a God that's ready to love you and to embrace you and to lift you up. So the Bible is clear. You make your way to God. You draw closer to God. And we are going to talk about the reasons why people don't do it. Because they don't have the confidence. They're not established in righteousness. They don't understand what Jesus did for them. So they live with constant guilt, shame, condemnation. So they never boldly come into the throne of grace. So the Bible says you draw closer to God, then God will draw closer to you. Psalm 73 verse 28, the Bible says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Say it is good for me. Say it tonight. Ah, Nehemiah. Say it is good for me to draw near to God. Because I've put my trust in God. Say it. Thank you. You may sit down. As the Father. Jy gaan moet leer druk, broer. Ek hoop jy druk jy vrou beter as dit. So Hebrews 10 verse uh, 19, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness, everybody say boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, having boldness, to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which He consecrated to us through the veil, that is His flesh. And having our high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Let us draw near. What we do when we come to church is we draw near to God. But more than that, we need to establish our prayer closet. We need to build an altar in our homes where we draw closer to God, where we spend time with God. Because from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, you will see the highest purpose that God has for your life and my life is to have an intimate relationship with God. And the more time you spend in God's presence, the more you are going to become like God, who is what? Love. Being transformed from glory to glory in the image of Christ. So the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more God's going to rub off on you. You watch people that have been married for a while or a long time. They look the same, right? Have you seen that? And then they, uh, yeah, I'll say, okay, don't now say anything. Uh, um, or you, 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 you see the children, they look like both parents, right? Van jylle sê nie, my kinders like net soos ek. Nie, hulle like, hulle het een bykie van altweer van jylle, ok? So miskien nie eens een persoonlijkheid en miskien jou looks, maar hulle het alles, hulle het al by. So the Bible says we have to draw close with a true heart in full assurance. Draw close to God in a, with a true heart in full assurance, meaning you have access. You can come as you are. You don't have to go from the outer court to the inner court to the holy place to the holy of holies. You don't have to go through cleansing rituals. You don't have to go through works. When, when, when I became a Christian, we were taught that prayer will. I've mentioned it once before, but there are many young people here tonight. And it was 12 five-minute segments, how to spend an hour with the Lord. How many of you can remember it? Some of you, right? And the first thing is you came and you confessed your sin. Now, if there's sin in your life, you have to confess it because the Bible says, if, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse 9, 1 John chapter 1 says, if, if you confess your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. But you do not come into God's presence sin conscious. You come into God's presence to have fellowship with the Father. Amen. And if there is sin, you confess it. So um, the second thing we learned was you have to enter with the, His courts with praise. So think about this. You're in your study and there you go. Uh, this is the day and you're praising, praising, praising because you taught that way. That you almost have to make your way into the presence of God. And then the third thing was, and I think this is still a very, very applicable one, is you had to search your heart and forgive people who sinned against you. I don't want to downplay this because I think many people don't move on in their walk with God because of unforgiveness and bitterness. And, and Jesus was very clear. If you come to the altar, 
That is your place of prayer, your place of fellowship with God. And they remember that your brother sinned against you. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift to God. Mark 11, uh, uh, 25, the Bible says, And when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. Matthew 18, he says, if, if you do not forgive, neither will Jesus forgive you. And people live a life of torment because they have issues with other people. Please hear me tonight. Do not allow issues in your heart toward anybody in your life. Live with a clear conscience before God and man and live with a heart of forgiveness. As a matter of fact, the Bible says forgiving one another. So forgiveness should never be an issue for the Christian because you have been forgiven for a multitude of sins. Think about it. How many sins you committed when you call upon the name of Jesus? He washed you. He cleansed you. So now He says, when you come into my presence, one of the things I think and, and believe we really have to do is we have to search our hearts. So there's nothing in our hearts toward any person. I was sitting there meeting this last week and, and the pastor was talking about unforgiveness and bitterness. And, uh, and then he said, and I'm actually going to preach on this because it's, it's, a, it's the real deal. I've prayed for how many people that live in torment, uh, that do not get healed from different kinds of diseases. And I'm not saying it's always the case, but many times I've prayed for people and they were not able to be healed until God gave me a word of knowledge that there was unforgiveness. I'll never forget the older man I prayed for. His wife was dead for years and years and years and years. He had rheumatoid arthritis. His, his fingers were bent over like this. He was bound and he was living in torment. His name was Um Arthur and I said to him, Um Arthur, is there somebody you have to forgive? He said, my wife. But his wife had been dead for 20 years already. She still kept him bound from the grave and he forgave her. And he confessed. And I'll tell you, when I prayed for him, God touched him and God healed him. So don't allow unforgiveness in your life. Come on, say amen. Because unforgiveness will become bitterness. Bitterness will become resentment. And resentment will be hatred. And, and, I, and I thought about that. That's why I want to do revival meetings. Because we're living in South Africa, in Africa. Many of our young people have gone through abuse, sexual molesta molestation, and many, many, many different things. And they have hurts that are so deep that they've never allowed to go. Well, I sat that night, two o'clock in my bed and I asked the Holy Ghost, show me, is there anybody that I have unforgiveness towards? Well, sometimes we just cover everything up and say, I'm okay with you, I've forgiven you, etc. And we're not talking about superficial stuff. We're talking about a father towards his son, a mother towards a daughter, the mother-in-law towards the son-in-law, joke, okay. We talk about those things that are so deep that people sometimes hide them in a place, in a box that they never want to address. So in the presence of God, I believe that is a prayer that we have to pray, not as a work. Because if we harbor bitterness and unforgiveness in our hearts, it's going to stop us in an intimate relationship with our Father. Are you listening to me tonight? We have to forgive because we were forgiven. I said we have to forgive because we were forgiven. We forgive because we have received forgiveness. We don't forgive because people deserve forgiveness. Neither did you deserve forgiveness. God forgave you. That's why He says, love your enemies. Amen. We don't feel like loving our enemies, but God says, love your enemies. God says, bless those who curse you. That's what God says. So we can't allow the issues of this life to pile up in our hearts. And our hearts become hardened. Because when your heart, listen, is hardened toward man, it will stop you in your relationship with God. You're going to become callous. You're going to become unspiritual. You're going to become dead to the move of God because the cross is vertical and horizontal. So we have, to, it's not just one way. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Every time Jesus talks about forgiveness, and Paul talks about forgiveness, he talks about us forgiving other people as well. Well, you receive forgiveness freely, but you have to forgive, free, for, you have to forgive freely. Say amen tonight. Come on in Jesus' name. I mean, your brother got the inheritance you never did. I saw people, I can't say too many things, but I've dealt with many people. And uh, 
the father dies, he leaves the child nothing, and the other, the firstborn, gets everything. And that child has to live with that. Or the child is written out of the will of the father. And it affects that person deeply. So you have to go before God and allow the Holy Spirit to help you because sometimes these things are so deep that we can't do it by ourselves. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and to heal us. And that healing will only come when we allow the Holy Spirit to bring that unforgiveness to the surface. Otherwise, people live in torment. I really do believe, and it's not a general statement, the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the doctors don't fight me now, but I think many people that suffer with mental illnesses is because there's a root of bitterness in them. Hello? You're very quiet here in this church. Because we, 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 we just want to cover things over, and this you can't. This you can't. That business, that, that business, that person that cheated you in business, that partner that betrayed you in business, things that happened, that really affected you, betrayal that happened, that really affected you. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to show you and go before God. Because I'll tell you, I sat in the service and I was like, he's praying and he's saying, okay, now pray. And I'm sitting there, okay, Lord, show me, show me. And I feel nothing. Two o'clock in the morning, I, I, I sit in my bed and I'm saying, okay, now I'm going to ask God again. Right? Yes. And I won't tell you what the Lord told me in any case. Because it's my business. But I forgave those million people. <laughs> oh, I'm just playing, man. It says, let's draw near to God, verse 22, in, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our faith, uh, hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. We don't just run this race for ourselves. We run the race with our brothers and our sisters because we want to cross the finish line together. Can you say Amen. To stir up love. What should we stir up? Love. What's the opposite of love? Hate. You can't love God and hate your brother. We stir up love. We don't stir up strife. We don't stir up hatred. Amen. And good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner is of some. But exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. So our pursuit of God should be our highest priority as Christians. Lift your hand and say it with me tonight as you, if you will. Say, my pursuit of God is my highest priority as a Christian. That means I have to draw closer to God. That means I have to spend time in the Word, not religiously, to get to know the Father. That means I have to love what God loves and hate what God hates. What does God hate? Hello, question. What does God hate? Sin. But He loves the sinner. So we have to love people the way God loves us. Amen. Thank you for the one hand clap. So the more time we spend in God's presence and in the Word of God, the more we will become like Him. Ephesians 5, the Bible says, Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. Walk in love. Be imitate God and walk in love. The more time you spend with God, the more you will walk in love. And love is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to talk about the love walk again, child of God, because we are called to imitate God. The Bible says God is love. We are called to walk in love, right? Love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Paul the Apostle, very learned man in Philippians chapter 3 says, What things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So he says, my first priority, I want to know Jesus more. He said, I want to be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, 
the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know Him. That word know is to know Him intimately, to be acquainted with God, not to know about God, but to know God intimately, to know the voice of God, to know the will of God. And my dear friend, that's not gonna happen if you don't spend time outside of God's Word. Time in God's Word will lead you to spend time with the Father because the Word reveals the Father. The more time you, will, you spend in God's Word, the more your spirit will desire to spend time with the Father. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit, who is the one who wrote this Bible through people, the Bible says uh, people were moved and they wrote these Holy Scriptures. He's the one that as you read the Word of God, you'll find the Scriptures jump out at you, right? You've ever found that? That's why you go into your closet with a diary because God talks to you and you put the date next to the place where God talks to you. And if God says something to you, you say to yourself, that's say of the Lord and you write the Scripture down. And then you obey what God tells you to do so that you can progress in your relationship with God. So Paul's cry is more than anything else, I want to know Him. Everything else I count as dung, I count as rubbish. So when God created man, it was for what? For fellowship. We were, the Bible says we were created by God and we were created for God. For eternity, our calling is not going to be doctors, lawyers, businessmen, pastors, bishops, whatever you call yourself. For eternity, we are going to be in the presence of Jesus and we are going to worship God and we are going to walk with God and we are going to dwell with God. That is our calling. That's why this world is designed to steal your attention and your focus away from time in the presence of God. John 17 verse 3, Jesus said, This is eternal life, not when you get to heaven one day, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That word know is a Greek word, which means a husband and a wife being intimate. So, so God wants intimacy with you. God wants time with you. God is waiting for you to draw closer to Him. And God says, when you draw closer to me, I'm going to draw closer to you. And I'm going to speak to you. And I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm going to make known my ways to you, as I did to Moses, who's called a friend of God, who spoke to God face to face. That's where we want to be, right? We don't just want to come to church and sing songs and clap our hands and listen to somebody preach. We actually want to experience God in this place and then go to our prayer closet and spend time with this living God in Jesus' name. So going back to the Garden of Eden, God creates Adam and Eve for intimacy, for friendship. God wanted a friend. Amen. Think about it. God. God doesn't have any needs. I understand that. But God desires fellowship. Fellowship to fellows in one ship. So Genesis 3 verse 8, the Bible says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. This is after Adam and Eve sinned, by the way. In the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? God's waiting for you. I said, God is waiting for you to draw closer to Him. And it's not like you needed a greed to get to know God. All you need is a desire to draw closer to God. And God comes to Adam as was God's custom every day to walk with Adam. Adam sins, what happens with sin, the wages of sin is death. Adam's conscience is affected. Now he fears. For the first time in his life, he experiences the emotion of fear. Until that day, he never knew fear. He knew love. Because fear is the opposite of love. Now he sins, guilt, shame, condemnation. He hides himself. That's why we have to talk about being established in righteousness and understand grace and understand what Jesus did for us so we can have the confidence to access the presence of God. Because if God says, uh, run up here quickly again. If God says, I'm waiting for you, if God says, draw near to me, why don't we draw near to God? What stops us from drawing closer to God? If, 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 if this infinite, infinite God 
if God of wisdom, God of all power, God of all knowledge, God who is love, God that has all the answers, is calling us to draw closer to God. We have to talk about what stops us. And I'll tell you what stops us. Hearts that are not set at peace with God. Not understanding what Jesus did for them. That nagging feeling of guilt and shame and condemnation. Still fearing God's judgment that keeps you away from entering the presence of God. So it's not a ritual, it's a calling, it's a relationship. It's a walk that we have been called unto, to walk with God as a friend of God. Come on, give the Lord a praise if you believe it tonight. Come on those on Faith TV and Praise TV tonight. God's waiting for you to draw closer to Him. God's waiting for you. Build an altar in your house. Make time in the presence of God and you will hear the voice of the Lord your God and you will experience what God has in mind for you. God bless you in Jesus' name. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. So the Lord calls out to Adam. He says, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. I mean, Adam is created in the image of God. Adam walks with God, then Adam sins, and Jesus came to redeem us from sin. And for the first time, Adam hides from God. He tries to cover his nakedness. Listen to me very clearly tonight. Jesus came to deal with your sin and the consequences of your sin. That's why we read, we now have boldness to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus Christ, not your works of righteousness. You can freely come. Hebrews chapter four says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in a time of need. We can come, but we have to come. We have to draw closer to God. And as we draw closer to God, God is gonna draw closer to us. So young God comes to Adam and Adam hides himself. You know, people hide, thank you once again, I appreciate that. Uh, people hide um, when, 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 when the emotions are disrupted. I want to go back to guilt, condemnation, shame, unforgiveness, bitterness. Those are real things. So they stay away from God. And my friend, you stay away from God, you're going to perish. You're going to wither. Because He's the vine, you're the branch. Unless you abide in Him. You will not produce fruit. So the calling is to walk with Him, to draw closer to Him, to spend time in His presence. And as you do that, I'll say it again. God is going to rub off on you. Your desires are going to change. Your thoughts are going to change. Your passions are going to change. Your outlook is going to change. Your friendships are going to change. Everything about you will change. Like we're saying, everything is changing now. How? In the presence of the Lord. As we spend time in the presence of God. When we become callous in our hearts toward people and the things of God, it is because there is an issue in your emotion. Please hear me. I mean, we can go through all the motions of the world and we can sing and not connect. You watch people in restaurants, the husband and the wife or the boyfriend, well, the boyfriend and girlfriend, because they kiss one another. Um, they're sitting, and I observe people, they sit and they don't say a word for one another, to one another. And everybody's on their cell phones. Have you watched that? They're there, but there's no connection. So we can't be young, there's no connection. We have to connect. Because when you connect with God, God never talks to you about anybody else. Amen. You can't say, God, it's this woman you gave me. Right? And then the woman said, it's this serpent. And then God said to the serpent, now you'll crawl on on your belly for the rest of your life. But Adam, you're going to pay the price because I told you, I have a relationship with you. So so Eve was never deceived. Oh, Eve was was deceived. Adam wasn't. He knew exactly what he did. He sold out. And yet, that's the miracle. Blows my mind. God comes to walk with him. And God calls him. For fellowship. God knew what Adam did. And still he came. 
And then Adam says, God, listen carefully, the woman you gave me. So what is Adam actually doing? He's blaming God for his sin. He's not blaming the woman. He says, the woman you. <laughs> I was okay without her. God, you said I'm not okay. You said it's not good for man to be alone. Now you gave me this woman. You. Now God can't be held guilty for sin. And the woman said, the devil, the serpent. And the serpent could say nothing. Because he's the devil, right? And still God comes. Listen, which is types and shadows of what Jesus did for us. And God, the first sacrifice takes place. God sacrifices an animal and he covers them with skins. He covers them with blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. So God comes and he, and he covers them with animal skin. They cover themselves with, with leaves. Um, uh, it's not a fig leaf. It's uh, whatever it was. It's irrelevant. Um, but God wants to restore the relationship. So God makes the first sacrifice. And he covers them so that they can have fellowship. So even there, God makes provision for the sin of Adam. Then you read the Bible, people that lived and died. There's Enoch that walks with God. Other people just had sons and daughters, they die. Enoch walked with God. One day they walked so far that God said, okay, it's too far for you to go back home. Just walk with me to heaven. He's one of the two witnesses that are going to come back one day. Think about that, that God... I don't want to say the need because it's not right. That God had the desire so much so to fellowship with man. That's why God created us. And it's evident in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, but even more so in the New Testament. That's why Jesus comes and reveals God as what? Our Father. Not a God, but a Father. A Father that is accessible. A Father that is loving. A Father that is merciful. A Father that is compassionate. A Father that has, that, whose arms are open wide. A Father who is always there. Now I understand. Some of us never had earthly fathers that loved us. So we struggle with the concept of a God or loves us as a Father. Many people with orphan hearts in the body of Christ. Although... Jesus already established their righteousness and they have access in the presence of God. They don't live as sons and daughters. They still try to work their way into the presence of God. I really believe it's one of the greatest revelations we need is to understand what Jesus did for us, not just to get us to heaven, but to give us access, what Adam lost, to give us access in the presence of God so we can walk with God. I can walk with God. You can walk with God. No matter what your name is, you can freely come into the presence of Jesus. You have access in the name of Jesus. You can come into the throne room of grace. It's not a throne room of judgment. And God will have a conversation with you. You will experience God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. Listen, throughout the Old Testament, God was always looking for a man or a woman that he could walk with. And those are the ones that are in the Bible. So there's Enoch, then there's Noah, who was a just man in his generation. And the Bible says, Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. Then there's Abram, that's called the friend of God. And God comes in Genesis chapter 18, 17 and 18, God has a meal with Abram. And then God says to the angels that are with him, he says, shall we hide from Abram the thing that we're about to do to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because I know Abram. The word know is I've been intimate with Abram. And I know that he's going to command his children to keep my ways and he's going to walk. And then this amazing conversation between a man and God. Think about it. And God says to, to, to Abram, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah has come against me because their ways are continually evil. And, 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 and Abram goes before God, he says, but God, won't you save them if there's 50 righteous? Think about this. He's interceding. It's a conversation. He's bold in the presence of God. He's talking on behalf of a city that has fallen in moral decay, a city that God is about to judge. 
and he cries out to God. He says, will you not save the city for 50? God says, for 50. He says, okay, Lord, can I ask you another thing? He says, if there's 40 righteous, God says, okay, for 40. Now listen, this is God who's made up his mind. And now Moses, or, or, or Abram is talking to God. Same thing, Moses. When God wanted to wipe out Israel, Moses is to God. But God, if you, if you kill them in the wilderness, the people are going to say you brought them into the wilderness to kill them. And God says, okay, I'm not going to kill them, but everybody under the age of 20 will live. Everybody over the age of 40 will die because of their rebellion. But a man, I don't want to say changes the mind of God, because the Bible says the Lord relented. The Lord changed His mind. Not God changed, He changed His mind because of the conversation of a man. And that's what true intercessors do. They stand and they pray. They call on the name of God. They stand in the gap. Amen. They stand, come I said, they stand in the gap. They pray for other people. They pray for God's mercy to be revealed and manifested, etc. So he goes down to 30. Then he goes down to 20. Then he goes down to 10. He says, I will only talk to you, ask you one more time. He could have gone down all the way to one because there was one righteous. But he stopped. And then he left. Then judgment came. Abram, the friend of God. Then there's Moses. When God comes down in Exodus chapter 20 to talk and the mountain shakes very dramatically, people say we are allowed in this church. When you get to heaven, you're going to get a shock. You know, when God showed up in the Old Testament, the whole mountain shook. It wasn't quiet. God shows up. It's dramatic. The whole mountain sh uh, uh, shakes. And the Bible says the people stood afar off. That's an understatement. They ran for 16 miles. They ran away. They were afraid of God. Then they said to Moses, please tell God, we don't want to talk to God. You talk to God and you tell us what God is saying. That was never God's plan. God came to talk to the whole nation. God came to talk to all of them. So listen to me. Yes, God inspires from the pulpit, but God wants a personal relationship with each and every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. You shouldn't say God talks through the man of God. God talks to you because you are a son, you are a daughter of God. Oh, come on tonight, man. You have access into the presence of God and you need to make use of that access. You have to draw closer to God and just learn to spend time in the presence of God. Because... God knows how to fix you. Religion messes you up. All you have to do is come. Come as you are. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation, no works, no trying to earn God's approval or favor. You come. You come with your pain, you come with your hurt, you come with your issues, you come. Your Father loves you so much that as you spend time in His presence, He will heal you, He will deliver you, He will cleanse you, he will change you. And He's a patient God. The Bible says, Paul says, confident of this, the good work He started in you, He will continue. But I have to say this again. The minute we stop drawing closer to God, something dies in us. Huh? And what replaces that? A distorted image of God, which is religion. So think about this, and I'm going to close here. When Moses is up receiving the commandments, then Aaron tells the people to bring the gold that they um, took from the people when they left Egypt. They borrowed it, never to give it back. And uh, Moses, the high priest, uh, Aaron, the high priest, comes with this brilliant idea. He says, let's make a golden calf. Think about it. W what is happening? What is happening? Moses delays coming down for 40 days. God keeps him up there supernatural fasting in the presence of God. They return to a former distorted image of God. You need to hear this because it's critical. That's what happens to people when they stop walking with God in the Bible and in intimacy. They return to a former distorted image. When they lived in Egypt, they were surrounded with golden images that the Egyptians worshipped. So when Moses, who now is the mouthpiece of God, delays coming, they make a golden calf. And they actually say, this is the calf, no, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. Imagine. So Moses comes down the mountain and he hears this noise down there and he, he, the music 
and he first thinks they are celebrating, they are rejoicing, but they were not. They turned back to Baal worship. They went back to a former distorted image of God. Now listen, when we stop spending time in the presence of God, we will turn back to works. We will turn back to legalism. We will turn back to trying to earn favor with God, etc. Because we will lose our position that Jesus Christ already has established for us. Moses comes down, he sins against God. He throws the Ten Commandments down. And he says to Aaron, now you're going you're gonna to grind this uh, golden calf and you're going to throw it into the water and you are going to drink it. And everybody's going to be sick for days and days and days because they chose to turn away from the living God. They chose to serve the God that I delivered them from. Listen to me, my brother and my sister. Onward, Christian soldier. You have to walk with God. Your pursuit of God should be your top your greatest and highest priority. You should never, ever, 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 ever let anyone or anything take you away from walking in this abiding relationship with Jesus. Please hear me. When, 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 when we spend time in God's presence, we are slow to speak and quick to listen. When we spend time in God's presence, our conversation is filled with love. Listen to me. We, 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 we don't just say things. We, we're careful about what we say. We're careful about what we do because we're protecting that place of intimacy. When we lose the place of intimacy, something dies and we become careless. I pray tonight that you make up your mind, wherever you are, sitting in Bloemfontein, in Johannesburg, in Cape Town, in Durban, in Khabarone, in beautiful Kimberley, wherever you are tonight, that in your heart there's a desire to draw closer to God because God's waiting for you. He's waiting for you with arms open wide. As your merciful high priest, the Bible says, let us draw near with a true heart, with full assurance. In 1 John chapter 3, the apostle writes, he says, if your heart does not condemn you, you have confidence towards God. Romans 8 verse 1 says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The Bible says, those who are in 1 John chapter 4, if you're established in love, you don't fear God. Because the person who fears God has not been perfected in love. He doesn't understand the love that God has for him. And that's what keeps people away, fear. Fear, the opposite emotion of love. And fear will always produce torment, guilt, shame, condemnation. Jesus came to do what? To establish you in a loving relationship with the Father. He made a way. His body became the veil that was rent. His body gives you access. That veil that was between the holy place and the holy of holies that was rent from top to bottom. That was a, a, a type of the flesh of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could go beyond the veil and make atonement for the sins of the people. When Jesus hung on the cross, he, his flesh became the veil. And his flesh was torn, ripped apart for you and me. And his blood was shed. And he ascended into the heavens and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat, which gives you access, a new and a living way. Father, I come. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb, I come freely. Undeserving, yet I come. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, and one moving tonight, please, in this place, in all our churches, just for a moment, as we do the altar call, not controlling anybody, but giving people the opportunity to make a decision. To say tonight, Maybe the prodigal son that walked away from your father. Maybe something happened that really disillusioned you and you're struggling with that guilt and bitterness and that's kept you away from God. And you've covered it so deep that you've lost your connection with God. This is real, people. This is real, real, real. Tonight you need to come back to Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here tonight there in Bloomfield and you've never given your life to Jesus. And tonight God's talking to you, knocking at your heart. And you say, what this pastor is talking about, I needed to hear. I need to come back to God. I've not drawn to God. I've actually run away from God like Jonah did. He ran from the presence of God. Listen, we never run from God. We run to Him. 
Tonight it doesn't matter what you've done. Tonight it matters what you do with this moment that presents itself. You can come and draw closer to God. Is God talking to you tonight? Forget the people around you. I don't care what you've done, where you've been. Tonight you can come freely into the presence of God and receive God's mercy and God's forgiveness. So while every head is bowed, every eye closed, people praying in all our churches tonight. Tonight you say, that's me. I need a fresh start with God, a new beginning. I want to come back. I want to give my life back to Jesus. I need a new beginning. If that's your desire, quietly, wherever you are, just raise your hand. Please, I want to say a prayer for you. Raise it up all over this place quickly. Just raise it up. Slip it up high. Quickly, raise it up. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Just raise it up quickly. Slip it up high. High. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Up there, up there, God bless you. Up there, all those hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Please look at me. You know, I went to church for years and years. I read my Bible every night. Elke aand gebed, Heere, we geef my genadelijk, al my sondes om my namens wil. Geen verhouding met die Heere gehad nie. Jesus sê, as jy weg die waarheid in die leven, niemand kom na die Vader behal wat dier my nie. There is no other way. There is one way to the Father. I don't care what everybody else says. There is one way to the Father. His name is Jesus. I want us to stand to our feet, please. Everybody in this place, quickly, please. Work with me just for a moment. In all our churches, stand to your feet quickly. Just for a moment. Many of you raised your hands tonight. I want to pray for you. There's a gentle spirit of God here tonight. God's working in many of you tonight to surrender your life to Christ, to start a new relationship with God, to give yourself back to Jesus. So all over this place, maybe you brought a friend. Your love can bring your friend to Jesus. So in all our churches tonight, if that's you, I want you to take your Bible, your personal belongings, whatever you brought to church, leave your seat wherever you are, don't think about it, and just walk down the aisle closest to you. We're going to pray with you right here at the altar tonight, and you are going to receive a new beginning, a fresh start in your walk with God. Come on, now we can clap our hands and encourage our friends as people come to the altar tonight. Come on in Jesus' name, come on. Come on. respond to the tugging of the Holy Spirit in your heart tonight. God is waiting for you. Don't allow that hurt, that anger, that bitterness to keep you. Come home, come home, come home, come home. Oh, come on, let's encourage people as they come. Many more walking there in Bloemfontein. Walk to the altar. God is waiting for you with His arms open wide. You come. You come, you come, you come, you come as you are. Come on, the Father will run to you tonight. Waiting for you. Come home.
pray with all of you. I just, you know, God loves you more than you'll ever imagine. It's, it's the greatest thing you can ever feel is the love of God more than anything else. God loves you like no man ever will. No person ever will. And God will never change toward you. Don't change towards Him. Even when you're unfaithful, He remains faithful and He waits for you. So tonight you're not standing before a throne of judgment. You're standing before a throne of grace. And you have to receive two things. God's forgiveness. And you have to forgive yourself. You have to forgive yourself. I, I never spoke about it. People sometimes are, are, are trapped in a place because they don't forgive themselves for what they did. That's as bad as not forgiving somebody else. And people who can't forgive themselves can't forgive other people in any case. People who are hard on, the, on, on themselves will be hard on other people. That's why he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You have to receive God's love for you. And once you feel God's love, God's love will flow from you to other people. Right? If you live in fear of God's judgment, you will judge other people. Because you're not established in righteousness. Your, your heart hasn't been established. Amen. Put your hand on your heart tonight. In all our church, just pray this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you died on the cross for all my sin. I believe you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. I believe you rose from the grave and you are alive. Tonight I ask you, Father, forgive my sin in Jesus' name. Wash me in your blood. Give me the power to live for you. I repent from all sin. And I turn my life over to you. And I invite your Holy Spirit to come tonight and to take your rightful place in me. I receive your forgiveness. And right now, by faith, I forgive everyone who sinned against me. In Jesus' name. Thank you that I'm born again. But I'm your child, forever redeemed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on. We give the Lord a praise for you tonight. We want to pray for you, please. Put a Bible in your hand. If you don't have a Bible, please, if you will turn to my right, your left. Go this way in uh, Pretoria and in Johannesburg. Also go this way. And in Bloemfontein, go that way to my left. Follow the pastors in all the churches tonight. Come on, saints, let's give them all. And may God bless you in Jesus' name. Come on. Come on. We encourage them. We love them. Every soul matters. Every person. Every life is precious. Every life is precious. Every life. Every life is precious. Every life is precious. Every life is precious. Hallelujah. 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 To the presence of God, yeah, listen. I want you to say a simple prayer, which I prayed, and God's going to wake you up. Listen to me. Um, my grandmother, when she died, and she was, I led her to the Lord, etc. Um, when, she, when she died, suddenly she saw demons, etc. And I was very concerned. She said, they're coming to get me, they're coming to get me. But you're a Christian. In torment. And we lead it through forgiveness again. Somebody else, you know, I pray for so many people on their deathbed, etc. And you see some people have total rest, and other people don't. They're resting, but they're born again. They're born again. 
they're wrestling. And it's always about unforgiveness. It's always about somebody they have to forgive. I prayed for somebody and the person sat up and, and looked in the, in the room like this and said, Kijk daar, kijk daar, look at that, look at that. And was, you were seeing demons coming to fetch him. Demons. Tongue talking. Tongue talking. Then I led that person in a confession again. Although born again, I led that person in a confession again. And then I said, now let's forgive everybody. And the person was not even a place to pray anymore. And I mentioned people's names. I said, which I thought by the Holy Ghost. I said, forgive this one. We forgive this one. We forgive that one. It's not something you can play with. It's not something you can play with. In Matthew 18, the Bible says, if we don't forgive people, we will live a life of torment. Torment. People have alcohol problems. People have addiction problems. People have emotional problems. They've got a lot of problems, issues that we pray for, and they don't get the deliverance, and the root cause of it is deep-rooted unforgiveness, which becomes bitterness which becomes resentment, which becomes hatred. The Bible says if you hate your brother, you are equal to a murderer. You hate someone. 1 John says you're a murderer because you've murdered that person in your heart. It says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Resentment means we've cut people off. Bitterness, we vomit about people. Bitterness, unforgiveness. It starts with unforgiveness, please, for a moment, for a moment. People lose their joy, their peace, and I'll say it again, their desire to pursue God. If that desire in you is not there to pursue God, you have to check your relationship with people because they work together. The second is like unto it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. You didn't say love God. Love your neighbor. He says, love God. The second is equal. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Equal. Right? Right? Uh, things happen that, that hurt people deeply. But don't allow the devil to gain advantage and bind you and torment you. So I'm asking you a simple little prayer tonight. To say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, show me if I have any bitterness or unforgiveness towards any person. We're not talking about the little, you know, somebody that cut you off in the road, some stupid thing like that. Really, if you've got unforgiveness with people that are just plain silly out there in, in civilization, I mean, please. We're not talking about that. We're talking about real issues, right, people? And normally it's family issues and work issues. Colleagues, work issues. It's like somebody says, I'm never going back to church because I was hurt in church. But were you, haven't you been hurt in a bank? Haven't you been hurt in a hospital? Dentist? I, I, I flew to Cape Town because I had to preach there. I waited, I don't want to say the place, for over an hour. And I'm offended. Can I post it? And will it make the news? Oh, I'm offended. Because I stood for an hour. And I got... Vocal. On a scarp start. Slop start. And everybody just like sheep are standing in the queue doing nothing, etc. But I'm now not offended. I'm just going to go find another, um, <laughs> um, what do you call it? Car rental company. So don't come with this thing. I was hurt in a church. I'll never go back to a church. Asseblieft toch, man. Asseblieft toch. 
you, you were, you've been hurt in a hospital, you've been mistreated, yeah, you went to a sports stadium and it wasn't the way you wanted, etc. Why must we always make the church uh, uh, say, well, if this happened in the church, I'm never going back there. Then be the same. Never go, if, if you got bad service in a, a supermarket, never put your foot in another supermarket again. Why do it to the church? Not this church, but church. Why? Why? Do you accept things everywhere? But when it comes to the kingdom of God, you want to live by different standards. Why? Why? No. That's the devil trying to stop you in your walk with God. Amen. Our faith is something we never give up on. Somebody said, don't join a perfect church because the day you do, that church will become imperfect. Because there's no church, perfect church, right? Sometimes the music will be too loud. Yes, and? Sometimes they sing a song I don't like. And? Sometimes the words aren't scriptural. Then I say to him, what did you just do? Don't sing that song again. And? Huh? And? And? It's like people rate our praise and worship. We're not praising and worshiping you. Let God rate our praise and worship. Let God decide. Let God decide whether He accepts our praise and worship. Who are you? Who are you to judge everybody's heart and say, these people are not worshiping God? Who are you? You walk with God, you'll, you'll say nothing about other people. Like zero. Amen. And those who spread lies, last time I looked, John 8, 44, Satan is the father of all lies. You don't call yourself a Christian and you lie. Satan is what? The accuser of the brethren. Huh? Satan is called the what? The slanderer. Look, if people in the world do it, it's one thing. But if people call themselves Christians and they do that, what Christianity is that? It's a question. What is that? It's no Christianity. It's religion. It's the same people that crucified Christ. Religious people. Don't be that. Be a reflection of the image of Christ. Walk in love. Be kind. Be merciful in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Say amen and give the Lord a praise. Come on. Come on. Let's be Christian. Christian. My word. Amen. Now put your hand on your heart. Everybody, please don't make light of this moment. Um, I also got offended in my journey. Actually, my one pastor offended me, and I had to forgive him. But I forgave him quickly. I was smart enough to forgive him quickly. Who else offended me? Um, yeah, it's real. Just pray this. Close your eyes. Become aware of God's presence on the inside. Because sometimes people want to talk to you, your, your children, your wife, your husband, and they want to talk you out of your, your unforgiveness and bitterness. No, this is your personal walk with God. Put your hand on your heart and just say this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, please show me if there's any root of bitterness in me towards anybody. And give me the grace and the power to forgive so I can live free in Jesus' name. And if I've sinned against anyone knowingly, I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to give them the grace 
to forgive me. I want to live free in every area of my life. Thank you that you forgave me. Therefore, I can forgive. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. Show me and help me to be free. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. I sometimes deal with people they're 60 and they have they've anger towards their parents of 80 or 90 years old etc it's come such a long time don't do that don't do it let it go even if you have to go cry before God you let it go you forgive you forgive so that the day you leave this earth you leave in peace not in torment amen God bless you. Take your seat. Watch the screen. Thank you. True spirituality that is pure in the eyes of our Father God is to make a difference in the lives of the orphans and the widows in their troubles and to refuse to be corrupted by the world's values. We hold the keys to lift those around us. We ought to love people and walk with them until they see full restoration in their lives. In our lost and decaying world, pain is in much supply, making it our duty to stand with the afflicted and bring Jesus to the hurting. Our CRC Cares and Women Ministries have been going into our communities, making a difference as we stand against gender-based violence. We've distributed 1,475 CRC Cares crates, prayed with those affected by gender-based violence, and saw 300 people give their lives to Jesus. This reminds us of Jesus' parable about the Good Samaritan. When everyone looks the other way and abdicates responsibility, we're left with countless lives that are changed by the adverse effects of neglect, abuse, and trauma. Jesus himself took responsibility by dying on the cross for you and me so that we can receive something that this world could never offer. Salvation, freedom, forgiveness, and peace. And now we get to give to our world what we have freely received. As a church, we've chosen to step into the gap and take up the fight, knowing that God can use us to bring kingdom culture to our country and turn South Africa into a testament of God's restoration and grace. Our church's initiatives and outreaches give everyone in this church many opportunities to make a difference and change the trajectory of our blessed land. We want to say thank you to every CRC member and volunteer for partnering with us as a church. We have many more outreaches planned for this campaign as we are committed to doing our part. We ask that you remain seated as the ushers prepare to wait on us for our tithes and offerings. Please note, the doors will remain locked for your security. God bless. Based on what I've done, it's His goodness. 
in truth if you'll be so kind just to take your seats and turn your attention to the screens for this week's announcements hi there family i'm Ange, and i'm city we would just like to welcome you to crc which we know is definitely the place to be. Absolutely, Ange. We are now in term two of 2024. We would like to encourage you to keep winning your world for Jesus. Pastor Art has been teaching us in so many ways how to win the lost at any cost. Let's keep going. We are here to expand God's kingdom. I said we are here to expand God's kingdom. Our purpose is to expand God's kingdom. So we are not settlers, we are not campers, we are movers and we are shakers. We are here not to roll over, we are here to take over. Come on, CRC. That's who we are. That's our DNA. We'll move and we'll get things moving wherever God has placed us. Amen, family. So at our church, we have a lot of things going on that you can be involved in. And just some of the dates that I want to remind you of is that we have new members orientation. So if you're not yet a member, but you'd like to be a member, God plants the members in the body according to His will. That will be happening on Tuesday, the 9th of April, 7 p.m. in our chapel. But we'll also have new members orientation on the 14th of April, directly after the 8.30 service. And then also in the evening, at five o'clock before the service starts. Then as you saw, we've got half night prayer this Friday. That's gonna be huge for us. So as Pastor I said, we're gonna stand in the gap and we're gonna pray. And that will start at half past six. So please make sure that you are here. And note as well that because of the half night prayer, we'll not have intercession on Thursday evening. Then Bible school. Pastor, I spoke about our pursuit and our relationship with God. So Bible school is hugely important. Term 2 starts on Tuesday, the 16th of April online. For more information or to enroll, visit the church website or the information desk after the service. Then we have our divorce support course that starts the 18th of April via an online platform. And again, for more information, you can go to the information desk. Then I want to encourage you, if you are not yet a member and you are not in a structure or a home cell, to please get involved because there's many things happening like John 3.16, spiritual gifts, baby dedication. And the best place to receive that information is in our structures through the pastors. 
Then our Beauty for Ashes campaign is continuing the, the packing dates. So please continue to drop off items in the CRC care boxes that you can see in our foyer. And then lastly, we'd like to ask some of our overseers to stay behind to pray for people. So if you are a member or a visitor and you would like us to pray for you, then please come after the service. We've got pastors, some of our leaders that will be standing here that will believe God with you. Let's close this service in Jesus' name. Father, we come before you humbly but boldly. And we know that you have called us for a time such as this. You have called us to expand your kingdom. We are not settlers, Lord, and we are here to take territory for your kingdom. So we pray that this week you guide us, you lead us. May we not forget the people on our Oikos lists. May we not forget the, the needy, the hungry, the poor, the dying out there. May we be very intentional to preach the gospel to every single one of them. And Father, as we gather on Friday, we know that you will move. As we gather on Wednesday in our home cells, we know, Lord, that you will touch us. And Holy Spirit, guide us as we pursue an intimate relationship with you. Thank you for every cheerful giver, for every giver that just continues the move of God here on our, in our city, on our planet, Father, and continue to expand your kingdom. We thank you and we honor you for all of them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen, family. Enjoy your evening. We'll see you soon. Amen.